the final culmination of this transformation of bacteria all the way to human beings is the idea that apes turned into people. Well, have they or haven't they? Dr. John Sanford is an expert in genetics. He spent his career at Cornell University. Uh, he invented what's called the gene gun, the ability to take some of the DNA code from one plant, place it into the nucleus of another plant, and change the characteristics of a plant. It is used widely in genetics across the world. This is a brilliant scientist who, for his entire career, believed in evolution. He believed that bacteria transformed into human beings and he believed the evidence was from the area of genetics. And yet as he continued to study he realized if evolution is true it's going in the wrong direction. Generation after generation our genetic code is like a book where random letters are changed and then that book is used to make the next copy where more letters are changed. And natural selection can't stop these changes. We now know, according to Dr. Sanford, that these mistakes are building up so rapidly the Earth could not be millions of years old. There couldn't be millions and tens of millions of generations that have passed because the genetic information would have been totally destroyed in that time period. Dr. Sanford realized this and he spent several years writing a book documenting the evidence. Now this book is called Genetic Entropy and the Mystery of the Genome. Why are we going to end a lecture on discovery and design talking about genetics? Because the final step of evolution would be this idea that apes turned into human beings and the supposed strongest proof that this has happened for decades has been presented in the textbooks and the museums and in the media as being found in genetics. The 98% similarity between chimpanzees and human beings and other such statements. We're going to wrap up with Dr. Sanford, an expert in this field, talking about what used to be the strongest evidences that genetics prove ape to human transformation have now been turned totally around and those are the evidences from genetics that are now showing us this could never have happened. I'd like you to listen very carefully to an expert in the field who will explain what science really shows us about where human beings have come from, where the abilities and the inventiveness of humanity has truly originated. Four powerful arguments that actually disprove evolution have come to light in the last decade. And that's like, it's, it, the, these arguments are incredibly strong. First one is programming of life. So I'd like to read a quote here from Bill Gates, who knows a little bit about computers, right? And so um, he says this, the understanding of life is a great subject Biological information is the most important information we can discover because over the next several decades it will revolutionize medicine. Human DNA is like a computer program but far, far more advanced than any software ever created. And in other words, the information system, just the information system within the DNA, is more sophisticated than our best uh, computer scientists can program. Way beyond what they could ever accomplish. Oftentimes when people try to teach the idea of ape to man evolution, they use like an illustration and so you just reshape a chimp into a human. But you see, what makes a human a human is the information. The human who has the genetic information necessary for doing calculus and, and sending men to the moon and for doing art. They're programmed to be humans and to have human bodies and that information is in the DNA. And Chimpanzees are programmed to be chimpanzees and to behave like chimpanzees. They're really good at climbing trees and they're really good at peeling bananas, for example. So this programming, it requires reprogramming. Now, one thing that computer scientists really, really understand really, really clearly is that programs don't arise by themselves. And you can't just trial and error try to improve a program. Let's just change a bit here and a bit there and a bite there. And, and maybe it'll morph into a totally new functional program. That's not how computer science works. And that's not how any information system works. Information is the product of intelligence. And so the information within a cell is staggering. I can't, I can't adequately explain it, except to say that the DNA is just the first level of the information. 
here's a concept that I think everyone can grasp is everything in the cell is talking to everything else. So there's crosstalk within all the components of a cell and between all the cells of a body. There's crosstalk continuously. It's similar to an internet system within a cell. And then we have a hundred trillion cells in our body and there's an internet that lets them talk to each other as well. It's staggering. Information is staggering. It makes information technology look puny. And so people, as we look at life and the way it's programmed, we should be in awe. How would you go about designing the human consciousness or creating musical genius? Or which nucleotides would you have to change to create those things? And so these things go beyond our comprehension, but God did it and it's wonderful. And we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And more and more God is showing that through biology, through the highest level molecular biology. He's revealing that to us. It's an amazing gift from God. The second problem is a genetic entropy. And this, this is something I've dedicated almost two decades of my life to. This is something I've studied probably more than anyone else on the planet. And it has to do with the fact that the genome, as wonderful as it is and wonderfully designed as it is, is degenerating. It's coming undone. Just like everything else, you know, you buy a new car, it starts to come apart over time. It rusts out and parts break. The same thing is happening in the genome and this increasing disorder is something that can't be stopped. Natural selection cannot stop the degeneration of the genome. And so this is recognized as a huge problem by evolutionists. Scripture indicates that uh, degeneration is happening. It says that we are dying people in a dying world. Genetic entropy is really easy to understand for us because it's a personal experience. We age and die because we mutate to that, literally. And so this problem of having the genome degenerate carries also into the next generation. And there's too many mutations that are pouring into the human population faster than natural selection could ever remove them. We, we contribute 100 new mutations to our children and our children contribute 100 new mutations to their children. So over the generations, each generation is more mutant than the previous one. So this is a grim and disturbing thing and it causes us to ask the question, where can we put our hope? Put your hope in God. That's really, that's a profound truth. The third huge problem is, can beneficial mutations override this degenerative process? And the answer is basically, beneficial mutations are exceedingly rare. The probability that a random typographical error is going to improve a book is astronomically small. So one of the more famous evolutionary experiments ever done was done by Dr. Lenski and his associates at the University of Michigan. It was a great experiment. They wanted to know to what extent a bacterial population would adapt to an artificial environment over deep time. So actually the deep time is just, you know, a, a few decades, but, but they're talking about generations. How many cell divisions happened during that experiment? Somebody worked really hard. A lot of people worked really hard to keep those cultures growing for 30 or 40 years something like 60,000 generations. The analysis was really surprising because there was adaptation, which you know, adaptation happens all the time. It's fine tuning to adjust to a new environment. But what's interesting is that all the adaptations involve loss of information. Maybe one in a million mutations was beneficial. The one that they've made the biggest deal about was just a loss of promoter specificity. In other words, a promoter that used to be able to turn on and off was basically broken, so it was always on. And in that artificial environment, that happened to be good. Maybe one in a million mutations was beneficial in their analysis. So basically, these rare beneficial mutations can't compensate for the vast number of mutations that are happening, um, that are damaging. So the Lenski experiment has been promoted as a proof of evolution, but really, it's a proof of reductive evolution. For good measure, there's one more. And this one I think is maybe the strongest, and that is the waiting time problem. And so I published this uh, in a secular journal with a number of colleagues. Normally, if you change a letter in a book, you don't expect a dramatic improvement. You know, random letters don't help you. You need to put them in a certain order so you can make a word at least. So the problem is that the mutation rate is disturbingly high if you look at our whole genome. We have about 100 new mutations 
per generation, but that's out of three billion letters in our genome. So if you're waiting for a specific letter to mutate to a single other letter, you have to wait a long time. So if we look at the contested bones, we put a graph in there summarizing this published work. And so basically it shows for one mutation in a population of 10,000, it takes 1.5 million years just to get a specific letter to change to a specific other letter. Uh, if you're waiting for two specific mutations, 84 million. So that's way beyond the 6 million years they say humans evolved. If you go up to five mutations, 2.3 billion years. Six mutations, basically the supposed age of the Earth, 4.2 billion. That's just to get six letters in a row would be a very small word. Uh, if, you have, if you're waiting for a string of eight letters, it would give you a new function. The waiting time is 18 billion years, much greater than the reputed age of the universe. That's crazy. The difference between chimp and human is approaching 300 million letters. So, so to get the information needed so that humans can be humans and have the brain functions we have and, and, and have science and art and all that, takes a huge amount of information, not just three letter changes, but extensive reprogramming. We're talking about amount of information equivalent to uh, two words like thank you. And you've taken more time than since the Big Bang. So this is a profound problem. We published this a few years ago. No one's contested it. There's silence. This is a profoundly powerful argument against human evolution or any type of evolution. And it's been widely read. We can see that, you know, like 10,000 people have read it and not a single person has raised an objection who says, oh, no, I don't agree with that or it's not right. It is right. We nailed it. And there's no, they can't contest it. And it's powerful. It's the last nail in the coffin in a sense. And it's really, really exciting that God has, by his grace, released us from these false claims. Just he's made those go away. And then he's given us these four powerful arguments that are just dynamite. Hallelujah. Is the conversation over? No. What proof could we provide to show that human evolution is false that would make the world change its mind? There, there is no argument. The world has set its mind on this belief system. And it's not a matter of just science. It's primarily a matter of ideology. And so this isn't going to go away. One of the things that I've, I've been asked, and it's coming from an atheist who's, you know, using, uh, he was being a little bit sarcastic. He's saying, so why did God make the apes? Was he just trying to make it look like we evolved from a lower life form? And I thought about that. I thought, you know, God, it would have been a lot easier for me if you hadn't made the apes. <laughs> because no one's going to believe that we came from dogs or horses or uh, anything else. But I'd like to suggest that there's another type of design on a level that we haven't normally talked about. And that is what I call intelligently designed ambiguity. God could eliminate all the ambiguity. He could just show up, right? He will someday, but he doesn't. He tests our faith. And so he allows ambiguity. The evolutionists will always have arguments. And so people who are waiting to accept the Lord because uh, evolution's been absolutely disproven, they're gonna have a long wait. There'll always be arguments. And so it becomes a matter of, do you trust the Lord or do you trust man? I've spent 18 years of my life looking at apologetics and defending from a genetic point of view scripture and showing that the evolutionary paradigm, which I used to believe that it's not viable. But all that is just to encourage believers to believe. But in heaven, when we meet the other believers, most of them will have never heard of Charles Darwin or the waiting time problem. They will have read and believed scripture and trusted the Lord. And that trumps everything. So the reason for these types of scientific arguments is simply to remove barriers 